In 1807, during his campaigns in Eastern Europe, Napoleon Bonaparte came across a young Polish countess by the name of Marie Walewska. She would soon become his mistress and laid to one of his great loves, but Marie, it seems, didn't feel the same way, instead using the emperor to restore her native country and for financial gain. Join me as we explore their controversial love affair. The woman who would be known as Countess Walewska throughout much of her adult life was born as Marie Vonchenska on the 7th of December 1786 in the village of Kiernoja in central Poland. She was born into a wealthy aristocratic family, her father being Count Mateusz Wonczenska, a prominent landowner and noble in the region, and her mother Eva also came from a wealthy background. She grew up in affluence accordingly, living at the palatial country estate of her parents and receiving an elite education. For instance, she was taught French, the lingua franca of 18th century Europe, by Nicolas Chopin, the father of the acclaimed pianist Frédéric Chopin. Despite the family's influence, it was also a difficult time for the Polish nobility. When Marie was born, Prussia, Russia and the Austrian Empire had already engaged in the first partition of Poland in 1772, robbing the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth of a huge amount of its territory, which was effectively carved up and divided between its three more powerful neighbours. In the course of the early 1790s, during Marie's childhood, the three nations engaged in two further partitions of Poland, following the third of which, the Polish state ceased to exist. Much of what is now considered Poland was absorbed by Prussia. The third partition in 1794 and 1795 was resisted by the Polish aristocracy, and Marie's father played a leading role in this conflict. He was killed at the Battle of Maciowita in October 1794. Marie and her other siblings grew up to become ardent Polish nationalists, and like many other Poles, yearned for the day when a Polish state free of German and Russian rule would re-emerge. The Wonczenska family entered into a period of considerable financial difficulty in the decade following Marie's father's death and the collapse of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It was in an effort to remedy the family's finances that Marie's mother married her off in 1804, when she was just 18 years of age, to Athanasius, Count Walewska. In doing so, she became the Countess Walewska. The only snag was that her new husband was nearly four times her age, 68 to be exact. As to be expected, Marie was described on her wedding day as the melancholy little bride, bereft of feeling, while her husband was reported as the old gentleman, beaming with self-satisfaction. The Count Walewska had been a major political figure at the court of the last king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Stanislaw August Poniatowski, and their marriage brought Marie into Polish nationalist circles in the mid-1800s. It was a time of revolutionary sentiment across much of Europe, as people in the regions like Poland looked to France as a potential ally against the more present enemies, such as Prussia and Russia. This would soon become of immense significance for Marie. In the meantime, in 1805, shortly after they were married, Marie gave birth to her and the Count's first and only child, a boy named Antony Rudolf. As we will see, Marie's relationship with her family, friends and other political figures would play a huge role in her life story and led to many happy moments, but it possibly also led to her doing many things she didn't want to do. If there is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, then today's paid partner BetterHelp could be perfect for you. I recently tried BetterHelp and it let me reflect on specific problems in my life and how I can get through them. We all have ups and downs, and a therapist to help you through it can be a great support. Starting therapy can be hard. Maybe you're too busy, 
can't find a therapist that works for you, or perhaps you find the face-to-face -face interaction uncomfortable. Whatever it is, BetterHelp connects you with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. You'll be able to schedule therapy sessions at a time that's convenient for you and however it's most comfortable for you, whether this is a phone call, video chat, or even via messaging. To get started, you fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs, and in about 48 hours in most cases, you'll get matched with your therapist. If you feel like you don't click with this therapist, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost. If you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash forgotten lives. Clicking this link helps support the channel and it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. In the course of 1805, 1806 and 1807, Napoleon ended up campaigning ever further east with his French armies. First, he found himself at war with the Austrians as part of the War of the Third Coalition. No sooner had he captured Vienna, defeated the Austrians and made peace with them, than Prussia declared war on France and so Bonaparte ended up campaigning northeastwards to Berlin, which he conquered before then campaigning in what is now Poland to try and defeat the Prussians there. The King of Prussia having retreated into the east of his dominions in search of aid from his Russian ally, Tsar Alexander I. It was in the course of his eastwards campaigns that Napoleon met Marie for the first time. Their initial meeting was quite by accident. At one point in his eastwards march, Napoleon stopped at a roadside inn to have his horses pulling his carriage replaced, and Marie happened to be there. Apparently, Marie gave him flowers, and they likely spoke for a while, as Napoleon soon made inquiries to find out who this beautiful unknown lady was. Yet, other accounts tell a different story. One version of these events state that Marie approached the leader of Napoleon's escort, and begged to meet with him, while others state this meeting never even happened. Whatever the truth, we know that she soon made an impression on him, as when he saw her at a gathering of Polish nobles in Warsaw, he instructed his staff that he wished to speak with her. Napoleon followed this up by sending the striking Marie two admiring notes, but he got no reply, making him even more interested in her. There is also controversy about the young woman's reaction to Napoleon's advances. Some researchers believe she was interested in a relationship with a great leader, but others assert she was embarrassed and scared, only humouring the emperor for the Polish cause. In any case, she was soon his mistress in Poland. The liaison was initially kept secret, although many in Warsaw higher circles knew what was going on. As they spent more time together, the relationship progressed, and they began to show genuine affection for each other. Napoleon spent several months in Poland finishing the war with Prussia and Russia into 1807, and he then concluded the Treaty of Tilsit to bring the War of the Fourth Coalition to an end. Thereafter, he returned to Paris in the autumn of 1807. From the French capital, he sent her a portrait of himself and some books, along with a note which read, My gentle and dear Marie, you who love your country so much will understand the joy I feel at being back in France after nearly a year away. This joy would be complete had you been here too, but I carry you in my heart. Napoleon's relationship with Marie was significant from a political perspective. In the summer of 1807 as part of the Treaty of Tilsit, Napoleon stripped Prussia of a huge amount of its territory in one of the harshest peace treaties he ever inflicted on a defeated nation. Much of his reason for doing so was in order to create a new Polish state. The Duchy of Warsaw was born just weeks later, with the promulgation of a new constitution. Clearly, part of Napoleon's reasoning in setting up this new state 
was that Polish rebels had supported him in the war against the Prussians, while he also wanted to create a useful vassal state here in Eastern Europe, which would be a strong ally of France's. Yet, there is no doubting that Countess Walewska was a strong influence on him as well in this respect, and her ardent Polish nationalism contributed to the rebirth of the Polish nation, however fleeting it would prove to be. While Napoleon seems to have fallen for Marie, her memoirs would have us believe that she did not feel the same way. She wrote, The sacrifice was complete. It was all about harvesting fruit now, achieving this one single equivalence, convincing Napoleon to support the Polish independence movement, which could excuse my debased position. This was the one thought that possessed me. Ruling over my will, it did not allow me to fall under the weight of my bad consciousness and sadness. Yet, as we will see, it seems that this is not entirely true. Unlike most of his other mistresses, who came and went quite quickly, Napoleon resumed his relationship with Walewska again in 1809. The occasion of their reunion was the War of the Fifth Coalition, which had brought Napoleon eastwards again from France to conquer Vienna in a war with Austria for the second time in less than half a decade. When he installed himself in the Austrian capital and was engaged in peace negotiations, Marie came southwest from the Duchy of Warsaw to join him in Vienna. It was during this reunion that their child was conceived. Back in Poland in early May 1810, she gave birth to a boy who was named Alexander Florian Joseph. Marie's husband acknowledged the child as his son, and many studies have argued that his parentage is debatable. However, there is no doubt from looking at photos of Alexandra from when he was in his mid-fifties that he was Napoleon's son. Well, the resemblance is striking, and this was confirmed by a DNA test in 2013. In 1810, Napoleon returned to Paris and made it clear that he wanted Marie nearby. She settled in a palatial residence with their son, which was provided by Napoleon, but their relationship soon came to an end. Following Napoleon's divorce from Josephine de Beauharnais, he married Marie-Louise, the daughter of the first emperor of Austria, in hopes of producing a legitimate heir. It's unknown if Napoleon saw Marie and their son at this time, but he made sure that they were well taken care of and financially secure. In 1812, Marie divorced her husband, who was now in his mid-70s, even as she was only in her mid-twenties. As a settlement, she and her oldest son received half of the Count's estates, which was considerable, despite the debts. She most likely had a reunion again with Napoleon around this time, as he arrived to Poland to prepare his armies for the invasion of Russia, which turned disastrous and ultimately cost him his empire in the years that followed. When he first abdicated in the spring of 1814 and was sent into exile for the first time as emperor of the island of Elba off the coast of Italy, Marie travelled there and joined him on the island. Her reasons for doing so is another source of debate. Some speculate that Napoleon's financial arrangements hadn't been fulfilled, and so Marie went to ask for money, but others state she simply wanted to be with her former lover and the father of her second son. After he fled back to France and tried to resume his position as emperor, it was the end of their contact. Napoleon was defeated for the final time at Waterloo, abdicated shortly afterwards, and was exiled to the island of St. Helena in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. In 1815, Marie's first husband died. It was around this time that she fell deeply in love with Count Philippe Antoine d'Ornano, a man whom she had known for several years and was close to. He was a French soldier, one of the marshals of Napoleon's army, and a leading general. Ironically, He was also Napoleon's cousin. They married in 1817 and settled in Liege, in what is now Belgium, 
but which was then Austrian Netherlands. There she quickly gave birth to her third child, another boy called Rodolf August. However, she died just six months later on the 11th of December 1817 from a kidney illness, which she had suffered from for much of her life. Walewska was just 31 years of age when she died. She was buried in Paris, though her remains were subsequently repatriated to Poland. The Duchy of Warsaw did not survive the collapse of Napoleon's empire, but two of her sons went on to play important roles in Europe's politics during the middle of the 19th century. Rodolf August was an important political figure during the Second Empire of the 1850s and 1860s when Napoleon's nephew was Emperor of France as Napoleon III. Similarly, Napoleon Marie's son Alexandre served as Foreign Minister of France under Napoleon III, to whom he was closely related. He played a central part in negotiating the peace terms at the end of the Crimean War of the mid-1850s. Marie completed her memoirs before she died, and they are an important source for the Napoleonic period of European history. A film of her life was produced in 1937, with Greta Garbo playing her. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on Marie Walewska, I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you thought of her life down below in the comments, and if you have any other suggestions, also be sure to leave them down below in the comments. I hope you guys are subscribed and have notifications turned on to get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.